Mad Magazine was like a big part of my life. And Mark Arnold has written an exhaustive history on Mad Magazine. It's just been released. Apparently, it's already doing really well. It's on top of the Amazon charts. It's already on top of the Amazon charts. You know, they do this to me all the time. I don't know I what don't the hell know. they do this it This is for. Casey and Hollywood. This is Casey Kasem in Hollywood. Mad Magazine's new exhaustive history is already on the top of the charts. Apparently, uh, it uh, is a story of how Mad Magazine, and he'll tell us a little bit of, about this now, went from being this obscure comic book to becoming a major American magazine. How about it for the great Mark Arnold, everybody? Hey. <laughs> Mark, thank you for sitting through everything as you waited in our green room. Uh, it is great to have you with us. It's great to be here. Thank you very tell much. Me, tell me, uh, then, it wasn't just me. Mad Magazine was part of many lives for many years. Oh, yeah. It's part of my life. I mean... <laughs> I started yeah, but when, when it did in, it when when did it break out? Well, it started as a comic book, like you said, in 1952, and it actually started breaking out as a comic book. The first few issues didn't sell very well or anything like that, and then they did a parody in the fourth issue about Superman called Super Duper Man, and everybody seemed to catch notice that this was pretty funny stuff. So. It became a hit, and uh, even my dad read it, which I found hard to believe. But <laughs> and uh, I started reading it in 1974, so I've been a, a steady reader ever since. And it did seem to satirize politics, it satirized media. It, it, mm -hmm. They they leaned into some stuff. Then they had some regular franchises. Spy versus Spy, I remember, was one of them. Right. Uh, there were a bunch of them, and and of course that poster child for. The magazine Alfred E. Newman, right? Mm -hmm. Which I have secretly under a bag on the cover because <laughs> this is unauthorized. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. But uh, because of that, yeah, uh, t uh, I can dish the dirt. I'm not really trying to dish the dirt, but there's some interesting things behind the scenes that official mad biographies have not disclosed easily. <laughs> so I'll put it that way. Uh, when you you talk to writers and editors of Mad Magazine, when you talk to them, what were the surprises along the way for those of us who were just you know passive consumers of the magazine? Well, um, the biggest surprise I found was that uh, you know they're very serious guys, even though they put out a wacky, uh, loony, zany type magazine. Um, They'll give you straight answers. Uh, I, I talked at length once with uh, Sam Viviano, who was their art director for over two decades. And, you know, he told me, you know, it was a job. It wasn't like goofing around. They did have some fun days and fun times. They appeared on 60 Minutes once and did some goofy stuff. But in general, it was just a job to produce humor for the masses. <laughs> and where do they came? where do they come from? They came from, uh, like, other magazines, The New Yorker, or I mean, what, what, like, what was the feeder work that brought them to <laughs> Mad Magazine? Well, William Gaines was the original publisher, and uh, his dad was a publisher too. His name was Max Gaines, and Max Gaines is actually kind of like the founder of the whole comic book industry. He helped uh, create. He didn't create any of these things, but he helped uh, bring along Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman back in the 30s. And then he branched off and made his own company called EC eventually. Uh, he, he died in an unfortunate boating accident. Son William took over and he decided to change it around to more of his liking and uh, went into other genres like horror and created titles or helped create titles like Tales from the Crypt, if you've heard of that. <laughs> sure. Wow. Balls of Horror, Weird Science, wow. you know, the science fiction title, Crime Suspense Stories, things like that. Um, one of the editors that they hired was a man named Harvey Kurtzman, and he came from a comic book, funny comic book background, working at Marvel back in the 40s and stuff like that. He went to EC, started doing war books like Two-Fisted Tales, and he was complaining about his income. And Gaines said to uh, Kurtzman, well, you have that humor background. Why don't you write a funny book? You can dash that off in a week, and uh, you could still work, concentrate on your war books. 
And unfortunately, Kurtzman being like a perfectionist and really into it, he spent more time on Mad than he did on the other one. <laughs> It is, the, it is the case that the thing took off. So there was a moment you're saying that, or was there a moment? What was the, in the evolution of the magazine, what brought it to Im immense prominence? I mean, it, it became, you know, this kind of from the primordial ooze of these writers that you describe and kind of doing it as a side hustle thing. They didn't even know how serious it would be. It, it exploded, didn't it? Yeah. Well, it exploded in two times. The first time, like I said, was when they did a Superman parody. And then it, it got a solid readership and it was selling as well as horror books. Um, then Kurtzman, about 1954, was getting antsy and said, I want to turn this into a real magazine. And Gaines didn't want to lose him. So he crunched the numbers and he said, all right, let's turn it into a magazine. And when it turned into a magazine, it became a brand new hit all over again because it was kind of geared towards more for adults than just children. So that was the weird thing. As a kid, I felt like I don't get all of this, but yeah. uh, it's still funny or weird or irreverent or something. It was landing with me, but I couldn't get everything in the magazine. Well, that was part of the appeal. I mean, I remember when I started reading, you know, they do parodies of movies like Death Wish. You know, I was far too young. I was like seven yeah. years old. I was far right. too young to be watching a movie like that. I saw it many years later, but you could read the parody and kind of get the gist of what they're talking about. Or The Godfather or um, what was another one around that time? Clockwork Orange, <laughs> things like that. So, What was the... Um, who was the guy who... The illustration, I feel like the art was a big part of Mad Magazine. Oh, yeah. Who, who um, were those artists? I mean, what, what was the story on them? There's a lot of different ones. The original artists on the comics were a man named Wally Wood, Jack Davis, and Will Elder. Uh, Wally Wood is really revered in comic book circles. Uh, he does excellent science fiction work and some of the horror work. Jack Davis, when he left Mad, he left for a time basically became kind of a household name from the standpoint as he did covers on time magazine just like that <laughs> uh, yeah uh tv guide magazine he did many many movie posters and he did a bunch of record albums for rca he became like one of the highest paid illustrators in the business so um they had their share later when a lot of the people left with kurtzman uh they brought in another editor who did edit Tales from the Crypt named Al Feldstein and he brought the magazine to a new level by bringing in a bunch of new artists and he brought in people like Don Martin who drew those crazy characters and Mort Drucker who did caricatures very very well and uh, a number of others you know the guy who did Spy versus Spy Antonio Prohias and Sergio Aragones who's still with us you know did the marginals and things like that so and Al Jaffe did the fold-ins and everything so he built it and you know it was a lot of repeat features but it was repeat features that brought people back to the magazine over and over was it a controversial magazine you know it, it took on so many of these things associated with controversial areas of life like church politics was yep. that a problem for them or back then were people not as easily triggered it feels as though people <sighs> have always, always been easily triggered <laughs> yeah um no they they had their problems off and on through the years i mean uh they did a story back in the comic book days called what's my shine that was a take on the tv show what's my line and the McCarthy era hearings and everything like that. I uh, got a lot of flack for that. Somewhere along the line in the early 60s, they did an article about the John Birch Society. They got a lot of flack for that. Uh, in the 70s, they uh, did a cover with the middle finger raised up and it said the number one Ech magazine. And they actually had to write an apology letter and send that out. Um, in more recent times, a lot of covers had uh, Donald Trump on them, and you know, a lot of people got angered because he, they were making fun of him. But he was the president, so that's why they were. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John says uh, something that probably is common. I had to get my parents to let me get it initially because I think it was considered kind of trashy <laughs> by some. That's true. Uh, it did have a kind of underground feel to it, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it did inspire a lot of underground comic artists and stuff like that, like uh, R. Crumb, Robert Crumb. Uh, he idolized Harvey Kurtzman in the early Mad Magazine. So uh, that was the, you know, 
that was like their gold as well. <laughs> so uh, as you spoke to all of these mad writers, um, mm -hmm. was it hard to get a hold of them? Did everybody want to speak or how did they, uh, how did the process of trying to find and track down the mad magazine story proceed? Yeah. Most of them were pretty easy to find uh, that were living. Unfortunately, a lot of them have passed away. Sure. Um, but of the living ones, uh, probably the, the only one that was difficult to get a hold of was a uh, longtime editor for 30 years, John Vaccara. But uh, I was able to get around that by interviewing uh, Bill Morrison, who was an editor for a time. Uh, Sam Viviano, like I said, was he was art director for uh, about 20, 20 years. Uh, interviewed Tom Richmond, who does, he's like the equivalent of a Mort Drucker nowadays and does caricature art and things like that. And they gave me very complete answers and things like that. Yeah, you you uh, see, you really got a lot of the luminaries. Let me ask you uh, quickly in our last couple of minutes here, um, Mad is back, right? It, what, what happened? Mad, give me the <laughs> what happened to it and then whether or not it's back and how it's back in the digital okay. age. Well, it never really completely went away. Um, what had happened is in 2018, uh, Warner Brothers uh, decided to move the entire operation from New York to Burbank, California. And in doing so, uh, there had to be a total change of staff. Only a couple people went out and made the move cross country. Uh, it, that's when Bill Morrison, who worked with the Simpsons and Bongo comics and things like that, became the editor. And he started to revitalize it and revamp it. They started the numbering over with number one. And unfortunately, they didn't really give him a great chance at it. And he was only in that position for about a year. And uh, then they let him go. And at that point, uh, this title became a reprint title, uh, except for like the covers are new and they occasionally have a new article and the fold-ins are new and, and the marginals are still new because Sergio still submits those. But it's kind of a shadow of its former self in that respect. But if you haven't read it in 30 years, yeah, that's the latest issue there <laughs> with Taylor Swift. I mean, that's Swift funny. And, that's yeah. that's, that's yeah. of the moment, right? That's yeah. uh, for people just listening, not seeing. That's uh, Alfred E. Newman as Travis Kelsey holding uh, a kind of, it's a funny caricature of Taylor Swift. Yeah, and your, your picture's a little fuzzy there, but uh, he's obviously played a football game, and so he's kind of smelly. She has a clothespin on her nose, so. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, I can't see that. You're right, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the latest issue, number 36. Like I said, they started the numbering over again. Um, and it's So a that's a hard. fresh cover, and that's yeah. related to, but you're saying when you actually get into it, it's primarily stuff that has existed prior. Yeah, yeah, for okay. the most part. They have a gentleman yeah. named uh, Johnny Sampson who does a brand new fold in. And uh, occasionally Tom Richmond will submit an article. Uh, like I said, they have new covers. But yeah, for the most part. And I'm hoping, as a lot of MAD fans are, they'll start increasing the number of the amount of new material and not have it such a reprint title. Does it exist as a magazine or is it just digital now? It is a physical magazine. Uh, you can't get it on the newsstands, on the regular newsstands anymore. You have to subscribe to it or get it in a comic book store, typically. Although uh, they do put out occasional specials, which also have reprints, uh, that make it into Barnes & Noble and things like that. So. Was it a, this is my last, I know I'm over time here, but I have, it's kind of <laughs> true. Was it a, thank you, Liz, a uh, big shout out for a, a $20 super sticker. Thank you for that. Big We're, shout out. For a, a crowdfunded show, so we give them shouts out, shout <laughs> shout outs when uh, we get anything. Um, I wanted to ask you about the demographic. Was it mostly a boy thing or did it, was it a ma it, it feels like it might skew male. Am I wrong? Well, traditionally, yes, it did. It definitely skewed male. Um, that was one of the things Bill Morrison was trying to change. Over the years, they did hire some female artists and writers and things like that. So the, it wasn't such a boys club. <laughs> what, what, where, this is a question I've seen in the chat a couple of times. Viewfinders present asked... Um, were any of the SNL writers at Mad or the other way around? It feels like maybe some of the subversive humor was kind of like an SNL yeah. kind of humor or parody. Well, I mean, if you go back to the original cast, Chevy Chase actually did a single piece in Mad about five years before he appeared on Saturday Night Live. So uh, they were all well aware of it. Um, it's kind of hand in hand. Of course, there's a Mad TV TV show that was sure. similar to Saturday Night Live for a number of years. 
And it was funny, and it launched a few careers, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, Mark, it's really exciting. Uh, congratulations on what apparently is early success with the book. It's called Unconditionally Mad. This is the first, um, is it unauthorized? Uh, unauthorized, is, yeah. Yes. The it's in two parts. Un That's part one, and there's a part B. <laughs> <laughs> I love that there's a part one and a part B. Unconditionally mad. Uh, put it up there again for me, Albert, please. I was just being able to see it. The first unauthorized history of Mad Magazine. Uh, there it is. So many uh, conversations with uh, uh, writers, with artists, with editors. Uh, congratulations. Really, really cool. Um, Mad TV was so much more um, unhinged and better than SNL, says S. Jones. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, the <laughs> illustration is just hilarious. That is a great illustration on your front cover, says Julie. Um, love that you put this together and looking forward to part B. Mark Arnold, congratulations. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. All right, Mark Arnold, everybody. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell, you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.